Okay. Um, well, does anyone have any questions about it? Probably all within epsilon of being done, probably. All what? Within epsilon of being done. Yeah! <laughs> right. Well, with epsilon, it's like 20 something. Like, I have a question about the 1.3. You're not going to let me forget that, are you? Huh? You're not going to let No. <laughs> Um, for 1.3 number 1, like the A and B part, well, yeah. it really just about the A, you know, they have like a plus and minus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, when you do like the first IVP, do you like choose one sign, and then when you do the other one, you choose the other? Oh, um. For 1.3? Uh, yeah. yeah, so basically you handle the plus and minus cases like just yeah. completely separate. Yeah. Uh, because so I do like, for, well, because I didn't see how, this, I'm probably not going to get my to really say but for, like, for x of 1 equal 2, I don't know how you could. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if that was a minus sign, how you could make that a 2. Uh, well, that, 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 that could very well happen. Then. Okay. Yeah, but I think to investigate like both cases. Like, try both cases. Okay. And, and if you don't get a solution, oh, well. Um, okay. Well, in fact, um, chances are, in most cases, there would only be a unique solution. That satisfies a given initial condition anyway, but I suggest checking out both because it may be a situation where a solution doesn't satisfy the assumptions about uniqueness, okay. and you might get two solutions. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. It, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because because what this function is giving is it's, it's plotting whole bunch of solution curves and. Uh, um, and yeah, so what, what could happen is, if you choose a minus sign, then um, yeah, there's no way to get an initial value that's no, greater yeah. than one. Yeah. yeah so, um, and then let's see, if you choose a plus sign, you can't get an initial value less than one. So you have to. So really, okay. Yeah. So that settles I it. I split it into two. Yeah. yeah. So, so so in fact, you could rule out one or the other okay. right away. Um, okay, and and then yeah. Uh, okay, so actually, there is always a unique solution. Yeah. Um, okay, that's so, what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions? All right. Um, actually, well, I've used up some of the time anyway. We have an hour and four minutes, but I may not have enough notes to cover the whole time anyway. Oh, boo hoo. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we're just uh, continuing on with uh, chapter two. Um, Fixed points already, but now we're going to uh, learn more about how to uh, classify them. And even though there's going to be some new concepts introduced today, it's really far easier to make them understandable if we just look at them through, uh, through an example. Because uh, otherwise, it's, um, it's something that would be uh, very difficult to explain. In, in this case, visualization is very helpful. Uh, so actually, the MATLAB function I wrote at the beginning of the semester about that would uh, plot a vector field has uh, come in very handy. Um, so if you uh, use MATLAB productive at all, you, uh, you might uh, find it useful as well. Or you can, if not, um, but if you're using other software that has decent uh, graphing capabilities, then you can um, uh, probably produce the same thing that way. Okay. So, um, and you just work some homework problems where you have to find some uh, fixed points, and we're going to do that. But then it's really how a solution behaves around the fixed points that could be widely varying. And we want to be able to classify fixed points um, based on what happens to the solution curves. Uh, near those points. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, well, you have.
got some practice with this already. Um, so let's see how you guys do. Stop cheating and looking at your notes. Um, so, what are the fixed points? Um, Well, okay, yeah, so I remember plus or minus one will make x prime zero. Right. Same thing. And the same value will not make the y prime zero, so we could go ahead and have y equals one. Yes. So one, one, and then minus one, one. Right. Okay. And then you're going to have x equals negative two. And y equals zero. Okay, so if x is minus two, then that wipes out this. Um, and then, so y has to be zero, right? Uh, yes, it would have and to be zero. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, because we covered that case already. So now we have this. So we have uh, right up here. So one minus two and minus one. Minus one two three. Yeah. Okay. So and that's all of them. Uh, so don't bother trying to look for more. Five is plenty. Um, okay. So, so, the question we're going to look at today is, how do nearby solution curves behave? Because a fixed point is a solution, is a solution that doesn't go anywhere, it's just a point in the um, xy plane. Um, Okay. Um, now, in order to get a feel for that, there's two ways to do this. There's visualization, uh, which I'll do first, and of course that's, that's a lot easier to determine the behavior. But then we'll actually be able to determine some cases, like algebraically, and also using uh, calculus, uh, very simple calculus actually, to uh, determine what kind of behavior we're going to get. So I'm going to attempt, I have a, um, so on page two of the, today's notes, but it's also, um, 51, 52, page 52 in the text is uh, the vector field. So I'll, um, but I'll try reproducing that here. Yeah. It was charging, oh. and I closed my computer, and I was like, oh, maybe that's why I quit. And I opened it again. Yeah. It's recording. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so as far as fixed points go, we have, okay, so I need plus or minus one, and then minus two, zero, so that's one fixed point. And then I have uh, plus or minus one at y equals one, one. And, and minus two. You know, it reminds me when I was in uh, seventh grade, my math teacher always insisted we say like negative one or negative two. We cannot say minus one or minus two. It's like oh, okay, minus two, negative it is. Then I get to college with a calculus professor is saying, you know, minus one, minus two. It's like, oh, okay. So those were rules. It was the other way for me. Oh, really? In Bangladesh, yeah. We always, you know, said like minus one, minus three. But in college here, people say like negative one and yeah. everything. So I kind of learned it here. Go see him. That's awesome. Go see him. Go see him. Go see him. Go see him. Go see Um, but yeah, so I hear some students saying a negative, negative, but like, ah, so they've been trained really well. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, uh, okay. Um, so for, um, so what happens with, 
uh, fix, this fixed point, so uh, 1 minus 2, if you look at nearby solution curves, all, any nearby solution curves tend to approach this point. It's attracting nearby solutions, so it's behaving something like this. So when they convert it. Yes. Is that the right way? Um, yeah, it's, or, or another way to say it is um, it is attracting nearby solutions. So we say that this is a, an asymptotically stable uh, fixed point. Um, and uh, so it's It attracts nearby solutions. Okay. Um, so this is one kind of behavior um, that, that we can get. Um, now, before we move on to the other fixed points, uh, so you can see this from a plot, but here's how you can show it um, algebraically. So. Uh, So consider x and y near um, 1 and minus 2. Okay. Um, so let's suppose I have, again, okay, I'll consider some cases. Uh, let's consider x is greater than 1, y is greater than minus 2. Now, I want to emphasize before we take, investigate this, x, think of x as being slightly greater than 1. y is slightly greater than minus 2. Because uh, if we don't have those assumptions, the behavior we're going to get uh, may not apply. We only care about nearness. OK, so the idea is, imagine what happens if you plug in points like these. If you want, you can think of them as being like, 1 plus epsilon and minus 2 plus epsilon. Um, plug these into x prime and y prime and see what you get. Is it positive or negative? So if x is a little greater than 1 and y is a little greater than minus 2 but, but therefore still negative, um, what happens if x prime? Is it going to be positive or negative? Negative. Yeah, because... Negative 2, right? Close to negative 2, a little bigger than negative. Yeah, because this part, the x squared minus 1, is going to be positive because x is greater than 1. But this being negative makes the whole thing negative. So x prime is negative. And what about uh, y prime? Is that going to be positive? Um, OK. Um, well, this is going to be positive. Um, that's going to be negative. And that's going to be positive. So, so this the whole thing is going to be negative. So what happens is, here's your fixed point of uh, 1 and minus 2. And here's a point that's out here, a nearby point. x prime and y prime are both negative. It's driving it towards the um, fixed point. So what happens is, if uh, the sign of the derivatives is opposite of the sign of the um, deviation, um, uh, from fixed point. And it is in both cases, it's attracting it. Um, so that, that, that's just one case. Um, and on the other hand, I'll just do one more. If x is still greater than 1 and y is less than minus 2, um, then x prime is uh, still going to be negative. Such a beautiful piece of chalk. Yeah. Nice and long, and I've ruined it. X prime is still negative, but then Y prime, because it is let Y is less than minus 2, this is now going to be negative. Still, still negative, negative, still positive. So Y prime is now positive. So a point over here that is in this quadrant with respect to 1 minus 2 is still going towards the fixed point. 
um, because x is decreasing towards 1, but y is now increasing towards minus 2. And if you check the other areas, like here or here, you'll see the same thing. It's always going towards. So that is uh, how you can detect algebraically uh, asymptotically stable fixed point. That it's no matter what uh, direction you're looking in. So do both the signs have to be opposite for like, both variables like in order to correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, it has, has to be like, unanimous. Um, yeah, it can't be like x is opposite and y is not opposite. Right, because then uh, let's suppose it was something like this. If it was going this way, yeah, it's, it's still going away from a fixed point. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are right, so there any questions about an asymptotically stable fixed point? When you said that x was greater than y and y is greater than negative 2, and you picked a point up in that quadrant up there, I thought you, when you said it was like near, I thought you meant it would have been like closer to the 1, negative 2. Oh, uh, well, you could think, I haven't set a scale in this picture, though. I, th th this, this scale well, could be like, it still been like point zero, 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 one for all I know. Oh, uh, well, I figured like, you made your y would have still been negative when you meant that. Oh, well, yeah, it is still negative. Well, yeah, yeah. All of this is, this is not an x-axis or y-axis. Oh, axis. oh, I thought it was. What is that? Oh, it's it, point. It, this, this is the line. Oh, that's the point. Yeah, this is one minus two. It's not zero, zero. Oh, okay. I, okay. I thought the same thing. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, these are not axes. Um, That's your point. Like, but we have to consider the region separately. Oh, okay. Well, that helps. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought, thought about this. Like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I but. thought it was an x and y axis. Okay. Okay, that helps. These are axes. Yeah, so I thought that was the same picture. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is zoomed in. That. Right okay. Mm, okay. All right. You good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any questions about this fixed point? Because we have four more to look at. Um, all right. So up here, um, so this is uh, x is still 1 and y is 1. Um, this one repels all solutions nearby. Um, so no matter what direction they are sent away, So this is an unstable fixed point. And you can check for it algebraically the same way. So if I had a point up here somewhere, near 1, 1, but uh, x and y are both slightly greater than 1, I would find x prime and y prime both going the opposite direction from this point. Uh, so opposite of what happened here. Um, so. Um, All right, so an unstable fixed point repels nearby solutions. Okay. Um, all right. Now, um, let's see. These two fixed points over here at uh, x equals minus 1, so minus 1, minus 2, and we have minus 1, 1. These two are also unstable fixed points, except it's not unanimous. The, um, most solution curves are repelled um, like in these directions. But for instance, along the horizontal axis, this actually attracts two solution curves. Um, so just along these two directions that are horizontal, but um, all other solution curves are sent away, and in a somewhat different manner um, than with this fixed point. So they're both unstable, but not in the same way. So this is unstable, and uh, this one at minus one minus two also unstable. It has its, essentially the same behavior as one up above. It actually attracts. Solution curves heading toward it vertically, but all others are uh, repelled. Like here, it's coming towards it, and then it's like, nope, don't come near here. Uh, and, okay. And they get away from me. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this one also unstable. All right. 
because they both repel all but a finite number of solution curves. Um, and then finally, at this uh, fixed point, uh, minus 2, 0, this is stable, but it is not asymptotically stable like this one down here. This one attracts all solution curves to it, because it's heading straight forward. And, um, but here what happens is nearby solution curves are neither attracted nor repelled. They orbit the point. So if you're close enough to minus 2, 0, um, the solution is um, neither attracted nor repelled. And I can show you what this looks like algebraically. Um, so for this case, let's assume that um, x, y is near minus 2, 0, but x is greater than minus 2 and y is greater than 0. Um, so let's see what happens with x prime and y prime in this case. Okay, so x is slightly greater than minus 2, y is positive. What happens if x prime? Positive. Yeah, it's positive. Okay. And what about uh, y prime? So it'd be like zero point something. Yeah. Yeah, it's negative. So notice here, there's agreement which suggests being repelled. Here, the signs disagree, so it suggests attract. So what happens is the point is up here somewhere. It's actually going this direction. So what does that mean for the orbit? What kind of orbit is it in terms of direction? Yes, it's a clockwise orbit. So you can tell if it, if, if it seems to be attracted in one direction and repelled in another. And if, it had, if that's true uniformly, like if you check anywhere around here, that's what you would get. That tells you not only that it's orbiting and therefore a stable fixed point, you can also deduce the direction of orbit. So yeah, the, all of these orbits near minus 2, 0 are clockwise. Um, and counterclockwise could happen. It just depends on the example. Because the x's were different and the y's were the same. Um, so, well, well, well for instance, that, that could happen. Um, let's see. Uh, so for instance, down here, um, if x is less than minus, no, that's not what I want. Um, OK, over here, for instance, x is less than minus 2, but x is going to decrease. Right. Um, and also, uh, y is um, less than 0, but y prime is going to is positive. So, so over here, down. it's the opposite situation of what you have here. So we'll try and go up yeah. that way. Yes. Um, counterclockwise. Uh, no, no, no. Still clockwise. Oh. Because what happens over here, x prime is going to be negative, right. and y prime is going to be positive. It's pointing this direction, so it's still trying to do the circle. But for counterclockwise, you would have to Oh, yeah. It's, 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 everything, everything flips. So x's would be opposite, and y would be yeah, on yeah. the same side. Yep. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so what you could do is, after you figure out which way it's going, just go ahead and draw an arrow. Right, right. It, uh, and they draw in, in like in all four quadrants, if you will, with respect to a fixed point, and you can kind of visualize which way it's going. Yeah. So, uh, here's why I don't put such a premium on being able to draw graphs, because not only can software do them, but you can figure out a lot of things out about the behavior without the benefit of a graph. Don't need those ticking graph. <laughs> So, so those are the classifications. So there's either unstable, which repels solution curves, stable, which means it neither attracts nor repels, thus causing orbital behavior, and then there's asymptotically stable, which attracts solution curves. Um, and you can use the signs of x prime and y prime to figure out which is which. It says in your notes that it's a counterclockwise. A what? Uh. Am I crazy? I mean. uh, it's clockwise. Okay. Picture says so. Wow, I must have really been out of it then.
I was going to ask how late were you up? <laughs> Actually, I think I was doing this on a weekend. So, so I really felt like being lazy. I was like, fine, I'll do notes. <laughs> So, uh, that just sucks. Never so, the weekend. <laughs> weekend for fun. I know. But, so, uh, so I wasn't up late tired. I was just grumpy. Okay. Nobody wants to do work on the weekend. Yes, but sometimes I have no choice. Because <laughs> I want to give good lectures. Okay. Um, or I can do what some people in the department do and just uh, take the textbook and just howl up here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could say people's names. I do. <laughs> it's also being recorded, Corey. I know that. Yeah, so that's why I'm not saying any names. Wait, I, I wasn't recorded at the beginning, was I? No. I start? Okay. No. Let's <laughs> just check it. I mean, I don't care. I just, I've said worse on recordings. I know. Okay. Do people really watch these? I've watched part of them. Um, Not you. Oh. Well, there's, yeah, there's two students. <laughs> You're who, here. Who You're here to hear this. Yeah, but there, are two, there are two students who are not never able. At least you've never seen them here. They're, they're down the coast. Right. Have you like edited this? Edited like edited this before you uploaded them? Or no? Um, that one time where I left a room for a while, right. I edited that out. Did I edit that? Um, yeah. So. Have they made any comments? No. Maybe not about anything that's been said, but okay. it doesn't really pick up very well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, not what you guys say, so okay. especially when you're sitting in the back. Oh, well, yeah. I'm not in the back anymore. <laughs> All right, so this is going to get interesting. You should just put her in the back. You should probably edit, like, half of it out. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> like, anytime, just while you're listening to it, anytime you hear Corey's voice, you'll be like, All right, this is gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes the 75 minutes more bearable. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one time I talked... Uh, 280, uh, a student was filming it, um, and what he would do is, because it's a long, long lecture, a large video file, what he would do is he would edit out, if I paused at all, mm. he would edit it out. So then if you watch it, and this is on YouTube, so you can find it, um, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> like, like a rabbit on speed. Uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah, so uh, at, at some point he stopped doing that and just left it that way because people thought it was kind of strange, but it was funny. Um, so if you ser do a search for like Mac 280 USM, you'll probably find it. Okay. Um, let's see how we're doing here. Okay. Um, all right, so this is one um, interesting uh, kind of behavior that can happen is certain points have a tendency to repel or attract or cause orbits of uh, solutions. Um, but it's not just fixed points that can do this. Um, okay. And that's why now I'm going to shift gears and talk about, um, actually, I'm going to just make sure that anybody who's watching can have one un uninterrupted look at the board. Uh, be before I move on. Um, so, uh, because you can also have not just points, but entire curves that, ha that can attract or repel nearby solution curves. And these are called limit cycles. Um, so now that anyone who's watching can have a good look at the board, we will switch boards and look into limit cycles. Whoa. Now it's got a case. I remember when I was foolish enough to buy an otter case. The guy at the AT&T store had an otter case on his phone. He took his phone to demonstrate, to like sell this to me. He goes, and just froze on the ground really hard um, and um, to show that it's so resilient. So I shelled out 50 bucks for an otter case. Within months, the thing fell apart, literally. It's just, yeah. So... Not recommended. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Limit cycle.
Okay. Um, this one also um, best discussed in the context of an example. Um, so x prime is 1 minus r squared x minus a plus r squared y. Okay. Um, now, r is r from polar coordinates. So square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's just so I wouldn't be, have to be writing square roots or, or, or x squared plus y squared all over the place <coughs> in these equations. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to change um, this system and convert it to polar coordinates. Um, so, um, so x, y is in polar coordinates r cosine theta, r sine theta. OK, so what we're going to do is um, if we have x, y is r cosine theta, r sine, r sine theta, we need to differentiate of these. Keep in mind everything here, x, y, r, theta, all of them are functions of t. So we're going to differentiate everything with respect to t. So x prime is going to be the derivative of this with respect to t. But r and theta both depend on t. So we have to use a product rule. Um, so that's going to be r prime cosine theta plus r times sine theta, and then by the chain rule, we're going to have theta prime. Okay. So, so then we can replace x prime with this. Um, so sim similarly, using prog rule, what we get for um, uh, y prime? Wait. R prime sine theta. That's a minus. Um, R prime sine theta. Yeah, plus r cosine theta, theta prime. Yeah, cosine theta and then theta prime. Okay. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, replace everything in this equation that depends on x and y with polar coordinates. So so this this will give you my left sides. Okay. So let's say I'll have. So for x prime equation, r prime cosine minus r sine theta, theta prime is equal to, okay, 1 minus r squared, x is r cosine theta, minus a plus r squared, y is r sine theta, okay. And then y prime equation, r prime sine plus r cosine theta, theta prime is equal to a plus r squared <coughs> plus u r sine theta, no, r cosine theta, um, plus 1 minus r squared r sine theta. Okay. Um, so now we have these terribly complicated equations uh, for r prime and theta prime, because those are our new variables. Uh, but it would be nice if we could come up with simpler equations that to say r prime equals something and uh, theta prime equals something. But in this case, fortunately, we can do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the entire first equation, both sides, and multiply by uh, cosine theta. And then I'm going to take the entire second equation and multiply it by sine theta. Um, now, and then what I'll do is I'll add 
the two equations together after multiplying them by their respective things. Um, so, the thing is, try not to, like, don't bother, like, writing everything out, because a lot of things are going to simplify. That's why we're doing this. So, can anyone tell me, if I go ahead and do this, so this times cosine theta plus this times sine theta, uh, what? Yeah, because we have r prime cosine squared plus r prime sine squared. Well, cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. It's the only trig identity that anybody ever remembers. Um, so this, this becomes r prime. Um, what about the rest of the left side? Those cancel out. Yeah, because we have minus r cosine theta sine theta, and then we have plus r cosine theta sine theta. So these guys will cancel out. So we have nothing on the left side except r prime, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, and then we can go ahead and add um, these two sides. And, uh, but that's going to work out pretty well for us, too. Um, so what's going to cancel in that case? The a plus r squared. Yeah, because we have a plus r squared r cosine times sine, and then we have minus a plus r squared r cosine times sine. So those terms go away, and then... So this is 1 minus r squared uh, r Yeah, because oh, these terms, of 1 minus r squared, we have cosine squared theta, and then here we have sine squared theta, those so that together to get 1, and we get... 1 minus r squared times r. So nice, simple equation there. OK. So and if Dr. Sure was coming from, you can go ahead and like write out the whole thing and see, OK, here's where things cancel, here's where things uh, combine. Uh, but that was a lot to write, and I was feeling lazy. So, uh, but, but this is how it happens. So any questions about? How we get that equation? Um, now, um, okay. Well, I'll be slightly less lazy and write these out one more time because we have an equation for r prime now, but we also want an equation that's similarly similarly simple. Four. Thanks. For theta prime, and we can, we can get that. second equation by cosine theta, and we'll go ahead and add them, and uh, so what, what's going to happen this time? Well, the r prime is um, Yeah, because we have r prime 
cosine times minus sine is going to be r prime cosine times sine is a plus. So these will cancel out. And similarly, the um, 1 minus r squared terms will cancel out because those are terms that pick up a cosine and times a sine and with opposite signs so they cancel out. And then so so over here now we're gonna have r sine squared and then r cosine squared equaling one. So we only have r theta prime on the left side and then on the uh, right side, um, what are we going to get? Yeah, a plus r squared times r. But uh, it gets even better because yeah, the r's cancel out. What? What? You have that written wrong in the head. Sorry. Because well, I'm actually doing manipulations as I type and then, okay. All right, well, I'll be fixing these later. Well, at least I can do that right after class while I'm waiting for this dang thing to upload. Uh, but thank you for catching that. Okay. All right. Um, so now we have our new system. Okay, so r prime is equal to 1 minus r squared r. And theta prime equals a plus r squared. So this is a nice autonomous uh, system. Uh, but even better, um, the r equation is, uh, it only depends on r. So in fact, we can just go ahead and solve this. We're, we're not going to do that now, but, um, but it's something that could be done. Um, and then the solution for that, you can plug into here to solve the equation for, uh, for theta. Um, OK. So, um, so what we'll do now is um, okay. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to let I'm going to pick a specific value for a. A is equal to minus four. <laughs> so theta prime is four minus r squared. Okay. Um, and now what we'll do is we'll take a look at fixed points for this equation. No, um, negative 4 plus r squared. Wait. Also known as r squared minus 4. Okay. But it won't. But not known as 4 minus r squared. Okay. Anyhow. <laughs> I knew it was supposed to be minus in there somewhere. <laughs> Okay. Can you tell us what it's going to be over? Um, so I get for waking up early. <laughs> and being up late. Okay. Okay. Well, at least that one wasn't a mistake in the notes. <laughs> or number one. <laughs> okay. Um, this equation. Um, what are the fixed points? Um, so, the idea is, um, all right, well, first, when r equals zero, that just means you have the origin um, as a uh, fixed point. Because um, it doesn't really matter what theta does, because uh, you're still going to be at the origin. Um, but when r is a constant, a non-zero constant, um, what sort of solution curve does that lead to? What, what, what do you, because you, you, look at this way, in Cartesian coordinates, x and y, if you have x equals constant, it's a vertical line. y equals constant, it's a horizontal line. But now in polar coordinates, if r is constant, what, what do you get then? Like an a cosine theta squared? Like, do we get a curve? Uh, well, but what, what kind of curve? Well, think about what r means. If it, what? G squared 
close coordinates is the radius, right? Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I thought that's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if a radius is constant, what we have is a circle. Bingo. Yes, it's a I circle. Was say that. <laughs> yeah, well, it helps. What? I just thought it was wrong. <laughs> what? Well, then say it. I I, I found you wrong. Huh? I thought we got you out of your second guessing phase. <laughs> just be quiet and teach. <laughs> That's impossible. I'm just. <laughs> That's impossible. Yeah. There gotta be a fix today. <laughs> I gathered that. I'm gonna be one right back. <laughs> Yes, but I can't be quiet and teach. <laughs> oh, wait, I just realized what I said. Yeah, I'm ready for this day to be over, too. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm in a lot of pain. Breathe it. Today was bad. This morning right. was rough. However, it's not necessarily a circle. Oh, we don't have it confirmed right. yet. Yeah. Because we don't know what theta is doing yet. Um, because what if we're not getting like an entire circle? We're restricted to a circle. Um, but... Let's see what happens. Um, so if uh, we'll make a chart here. Um, so if r is equal to 0, 1, or minus 1, then what do we have for theta prime? We can just go back to this equation. Um, and in either case, so, so theta prime is just going to be equal to minus 4 in this case, and then it's going to be equal to minus 3 in the other cases. So theta prime, no matter what, in these cases, is a constant. So if theta prime is a constant, what's theta? Theta prime is a constant? Yeah. So it's like just... It's on the three T or something. Theta. It has to have theta. Right? Yeah, constant. Not, not, not theta. But theta it's is a function t. of t, t. So it's a constant t. times t. So that means that... So theta is like the minus 4t plus some arbitrary constant in that, depending on initial conditions. So either way, theta is a linear function of t, but that means theta is going to go on forever. You're going to uh, keep going around the, the circle. So what happens, right, so let's make things simpler. Let's suppose that the arbitrary constant is 0. And so for a case of uh, r equals... One, um, so we're starting off here where uh, theta of zero is zero, but then theta is equal to minus four t. So we're going to get a circle of radius one, but it's going to be traced out in which direction? No, theta is. Starts, it's going to go negative on you as t increases. So it's going to be a part right? Yes, because, because you start out with start negative out theta. With that way. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, in, okay, so in this, uh, oh, minus 3t. Yeah, I'm looking at this case. Um, okay. Now, um, actually, there's one other case I want to look at um, just to see what happens. Uh, so this will be the case where r is equal to minus 1. So we'll still start theta at the same place. Theta is, so we'll just make arbitrary constant 0. So theta is still going to go negative. Um, but then what happens is, okay, so if I consider sm small negative theta, but keep in mind, r is equal to minus 1 now. So you don't put points over here. You put points over here. So like if we're down here, r is equal to minus 1 is going to put us over here. It's still going to go clockwise. Um, so you're still going to trace out the circle in a clockwise direction, but it has a different starting point because r of the r being negative and you reflect for the origin. But it doesn't change the direction. <clears throat> Okay, um, so when you have a fixed point in R, and assuming that theta goes on forever, one way or another, um, that creates a circle, that, so it's like a fixed uh, a solution curve that's a circle. Um, now, 
Um, but this is not necessarily a limit cycle um, because a limit cycle is not just about having a particular solution curve like this circle. It depends on how this uh, circle interacts with other solution curves. Um, so it's kind of the same analysis that we just did earlier with uh, stable and unstable fixed points. So now we're going to look at it from that point of view and see. Um, so, so the question we need to answer is, um, yeah, how do solution curves behave near the circle um, r equals 1. Um, so the idea is if this circle has the effect of attracting nearby solution curves or repelling nearby solution curves, then we call it a limit cycle. And we can also classify it as a stable or an unstable uh, limit cycle, depending on the behavior uh, that we get. Okay. Um, so, who's calling me? That's weird. Okay. Um, no, someone from Atlanta. It's like, why? <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, actually, I'm going to leave this here while erasing. Does the negative 4 or the negative 3 have any impact? Like, not really. Um, the point is, it's a linear function of t, so right. it fails to multiply. Yeah, the, the, the sign of a coefficient would affect the direction in which it's traced out, but that, that's it. The value of the coefficient. Um, yeah. And then the, the value of a slope, like the absolute value, would determine the speed at which speed. it's traced out. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. So let's see if this circle r equals 1 is a limit cycle at all, and if so, um, what kind of limit cycle? Either up here or in the notes, because there's actually very little notes left. It looks a voicemail too. What do they want? Ugh. Okay. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to plot the vector field that we got in polar coordinates. Um, so in R, that's going to be 1 minus R squared times R. And then in theta, it's going to be r squared minus 4. Okay. Um, now, um, so I have this. It's actually on uh, page 3 of the notes. Although it looked rather different than the um, one in the text, although the, the important behavior uh, was the same. Um, okay, so what we care about is... Uh, So this is, I'm not treating R as polar coordinates. We actually have an R axis and theta axis um, for investigating the behavior of this vector field. So the uh, curve of interest is this one, R equals 1. So the idea is we're going to plot solution curves near R equals 1 and see are they drawn to it or are they repelled by it. And uh, what ends up happening is... Um, they're drawn to it. So on this side, they're uh, horizontal for a while, and then they turn towards it as they get close to r equals 1 uh, on that side. And then here they also, on the left side, they also approach it, but um, in a more curved manner like this. Okay. Um, so, so the circle r equals 1 attracts 
nearby solution curves. So we say that it is a stable Linux cycle. Okay. Whereas if we had found the opposite behavior where it repels all nearby solution curves, then we say it's an unstable uh, limit cycle. Um, I'm not sure, okay, based on how terminology is used with fixed points, I would I imagine that if it was the case where it repelled some but attracted others, like maybe it repelled on this side but attracted on this side, um, sometimes that is called semi-stable. Like for instance, yeah, in an autonomous system, a fixed point that repels um, on like a, a repels on one, in one dimension that repels on one side tracks another is called semi-stable. Um, so, uh, so, so a similar term could probably be used in that case with these limit cycles, and people would know what you mean. Um, now, I should mention though, it's possible for a um, system to have a limit cycle that is not a circle. Um, in this case, uh, we were able to convert the system to polar coordinates and then look for fixed points in R. And that is a good way to find circular limit cycles. But if, it's, uh, if, a, if a system is a limit cycle that's some other kind of curve, um, you might have a hard time getting it. Um, really, the best thing to do is, if you think you might have a limit cycle, go ahead and plot the vector field, uh, whether it's in uh, Cartesian or polar coordinates, and then just inspect it. Uh, so if you, um, actually, in retrospect, what I should have done, and I may do later and add to these notes, is um, uh, go ahead and um, plot the, uh, vector, the vector field of the original system in X and Y. And, um, and that, so then you can see in that sense, you can see the circle X squared plus Y squared equals 1 and see solution curves, um, in this case, heading towards it because it's uh, stable. Um, oh, that reminds me. Um, there's been a couple cases where because I always have the notes ready before class because I'm using them in here. But then um, and there's been a couple cases where I go back after class and uh, update them. And I want to make sure that um, you were aware of that. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's one in particular. Like um, I already told you guys I went back and modified the fir very first set of notes. Um, to add uh, like a MATLAB code and uh, plots of uh, vector fields, um, and then code that you guys could use to um, uh, plot vector fields yourself. Now, um, but there was another. Let's see if I can dig it up. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, I found it. Um, so this is, actually it's a previous class. Uh, so it was last Wednesday. Um, okay, so I'll just write it on the board. Um, uh, updated notes, um, so sections 2.1 and 2.2 that was covered on uh, September 2nd. Um, so if you go back there and you'll see there's um, because what I did was, in class, I worked out an example, um, but on the board, it got kind of messy. Um, actually, it just got kind of ugly. Um, so I wrote all that same stuff up nice and neat in the notes. Um, and that has to do with um, okay, uh, gradient vector fields. So I had an example in there already, but I didn't really say very much about how you actually work it out. So I just put more detail. Um, same detail that I did here, but easier to follow. And now, of course, I'll have to update these notes because there were two mistakes found. Okay. So, in the uh, last seven minutes, um, do we have any questions about uh, limit cycles and such? When I did um, oh, um, 
So if, if like for instance, if you're not really getting repelling or attracting behavior at all. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah then it's, it's yeah limit cycle because um, there has to be something interesting, be ha interesting happening around the limit cycle. Um, like for instance, suppose nearby solutions are simply orbiting. Right. That's not a limit cycle. Partially attract or repel. Yeah, yeah. If it's doing neither, then it's not a limit cycle. Right. So you're saying if it's not a circle, if it's different, then it could may or may not be a limit cycle. Uh, well, it, um, being a circle or not doesn't matter. The same okay. definitions apply, but um, it's just how do you find it? Mm -hmm. uh, like here, we, we did a change to polar coordinates. Now, if you think it's something like maybe an ellipse or some other curve and you can easily parameterize. Maybe you can go to those kind of coordinates, but of course it's going to be a bit harder to do. Um, so chances are like, visually inspecting a vector field first would be a good idea. And if you see, oh, there appears to be some sort of strangely shaped limit cycle, maybe then you can find it, but good luck. Um, so uh, actually, um, in uh, the previous section on fixed points and stability, uh, I'm very... This book does not have many exercises, as you've noticed, in any of the sections, or very rarely. And I did not find any problems in 2.3 that I felt were humane to give you. Um, or they just weren't practical because he, this author is so fixated on maple and, and problems involving maple worksheets. And we're not doing maple. It, it's awful. So, um, so I, I couldn't give you any problems from 2.3. I know, boo-hoo. But... Um, so, uh, this homework set for chapter two, we're going we're to finish up chapter two on Monday. Um, and actually, that'll be an interesting one because it's about the uh, two-body problem. And um, so we actually come up with um, Kepler's second law. Um, so, uh, so it's about uh, uh, planetary motion and things like that. So that'll be cool. Um, so you only have like five problems to do for chapter two. Um, and then we'll get into... Chapter 3, The Existence Uniqueness Theorem, next Wednesday. And by the end of that lecture, you'll probably want to kill yourselves. Um, um, That's well, in the best calculus, they do it, like, existence uniqueness in terms of calculus. Um, yeah. Um, what day is that? Uh, <laughs> next Wednesday. You can't say the quality. Why not? <laughs> I'm going to give a problem on it. So. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. And you can read the notes. Which I'm probably going to ruin this weekend writing. <laughs> so the advantage to skipping versus not, <laughs> and the notes are going to be messed up anyway. <laughs> we'll miss you, Corey. You, <laughs> you opened it. You opened that one up. Uh huh. You did. Um, well, um, then maybe I'll ruin tonight instead of the weekend. <laughs> um, so, well, apparently this is. Uh, what, what can I do with notes? Either at night when I'm tired, or on the weekend when I'm grumpy doing them. So I guess there's going to be. It's a trade off. But, or it's going to be mistakes either way. So, um, yeah, but, but you have to decide what's the better way for you to digest it, either sitting in class or, or reading the notes. So. Oh, well, this is, you know, if I show up, I have a shot. If I don't show up. Yeah, so. Um, but so that's, that's everybody's preference. So. Okay, so question? Okay, well, then, until Monday. <laughs> I like how it's Monday holidays. <laughs> <laughs>